Apple doesn't own augmented reality. What is augmented reality? This part of the video brought to you by the folks at TCL Ray Neo and their Next Wear S, an XR headset with 1080p micro OLEDs that simulate a large screen TV anywhere you want to go. Head tracking delivers fun augmented reality experiences. New and improved speakers offer better clarity and immersion. And accessories attach quickly thanks to magnetic connections. You won't find a better polished way to add a big screen to your next adventure. More info on TCL Ray Neo and the Next Wear S listed in the description below. The folks at TCL Ray Neo are sponsoring this video to share some of the things you need to know about strapping a display to your face and augmenting your reality. To find some terms, help you out, and that first question is the perfect place to start. What is AR? Now, at one end of the spectrum, we have virtual reality, VR. That's a totally enclosed and immersive experience. You go somewhere else. There's no attachment to the location that you're in. It's completely immersive. At the other end of the spectrum, you have augmented reality. You can see everything around you. You interact still with the real world and information is layered on top of the real world. Another term you might have heard though is mixed reality, and that's somewhere in between AR and VR. Right now, mixed reality mostly looks like a VR helmet, but with cameras to send real world video information to the user. Users aren't really looking out at things around them, they're seeing a video feed. It's a little like the difference between a DSLR and a mirrorless camera. A DSLR has a mirror and you see the actual light traveling through the lens. A mirrorless camera sends you a video feed from the sensor electronically to another display. And lastly, for these broad terms, there's XR or X extended reality. This is the broad catch-all term for any kind of display that interacts with the user. It's the way that we can talk about all of these technologies without always having to say AR or VR or MR, etc, etc. And with those terms out of the way, are these kinds of glasses really augmented reality? Yeah, I'll explain. See, a lot of tech reviewers and the public at large have been watching cool science fiction films for decades now, and the promise of Robocop and Terminator and now Iron Man style visual systems, it captivates the imagination. But anything that applies digital information at eye level while leaving the viewer's vision free to see the rest of the world around them is an AR system. We can make that like a smartwatch. A heads up display like Google Glass is a way to augment your reality. Or glasses like these, the Next Wear S, are a work and entertainment way to augment your reality. You can watch that movie on a flight, but you can also see the flight attendant when they walk by your seat. And the flight attendant won't be looking at a creepy, uncanny valley animated version of your face. Tech journalists have been overpromising the future of heads-up displays for over a decade now. Tons of articles and videos out about sleek glasses with full location awareness, sophisticated holographic animations, and optical watermelon detection capabilities, and all for a disruptively low price. Now that Apple has announced Vision Pro, boy howdy, those don't look anything like the sleek wireframe glasses Tony Stark wears. And boy howdy, are they a lot more expensive than tech journalists have been promising they would be. While a little less fanciful than sci-fi magic depicted through computer-generated visual effects, it's incredible that we've arrived at a product that can act as a portable television or a portable projector, but it can also fold up and fit in a shirt pocket. Immediately from my first test drive of the Nextwear G almost three years ago to the production of this video in 2023, these glasses have become a strong recommendation for folks looking to replace a portable monitor. I believe buying a portable monitor of some kind is one of the best accessories you can invest in to add more use to the gadgets and computers you already own. XR glasses are one of the more exotic ways that you can invest in a portable display. Or you can shove a TV in a briefcase, I guess, but good luck really using that on an airplane. Which brings us to the next area of confusion, the screen size. And apologies to the PR folks at Ray Neo, but I hate how we talk about this. So many silly measurements at different distances. It's like a 130 inch screen. No, it's like a 200 inch screen. Oh, I think it's like a 300 inch screen. It's like an IMAX screen that fits in your pocket. Yeah, but no. The experience of using a face display like this 
is so unfamiliar to most of the public, we're trying to find ways to describe what it's kind of like. I find these attempts clumsy and often more confusing than helpful. Close your eyes right now. Just listen to the sound of my voice. And in your brain, I want you to imagine what it would look like to watch a movie on a 120 inch screen from a distance of four meters. We can all totally conceptualize what that looks like, right? The 100 to 300 inch descriptions are technically accurate, but they don't really help, you know? I just checked into this cute little New York City hotel room, and these are definitely bigger than the adorable little TV they have in here. It's kind of like the early days of MP3 players and how exhausting it was when people would ask, well, how many songs can it hold? And you'd try. I mean, you'd make an effort to explain storage and compression and file quality and you'd see their eyes glaze over. To get a better handle on this, I have to hit you with a few optical numbers. In headset land, field of view is a critically important number. The higher the field of view, FOV, the more space an XR display will take up where you look. VR headsets promote that FOV number heavily as that's one of the measurements that helps us understand immersion. If the headset can fill our peripheral vision, it's more immersive. But our vision is not one thing. We have a wide field of peripheral vision, which is useful for general movement, but has very little color or clarity. We have a narrower field of binocular vision with good depth tracking. And then we have an even smaller field of view of high resolution vision. I can refer you to this charming XKCD comic and notice the chart measurement only extends out to around a 30 degree area. When we account for how our eyes move in our skull and how they see different qualities at different measurements and distances, we can't rely on just one simple metric to describe the quality of XR glasses. But how many songs can it hold? A company might try to impress you with resolution. Glasses use these fancy micro OLEDs and special optics that route visual information into your eye. Consumers will be impressed when they see the bigger numbers, full HD, quad HD, and 4K resolution, but how much resolution does your peripheral vision need? This is where pixels per degree come into play. Pixels per degree or PPD. If you take a higher resolution micro OLED, but then spread those pixels out over a larger area, your pixel density will be lower. Take an $1,100 headset from HTC. It has a slightly higher resolution per eye than the next wear S, but that resolution is spread out over a much larger field of view. The PPD, the pixel density, is significantly lower. The HTC is gonna be better for completely containing your skull, occupying all of your vision, and creating that immersive entertainment experience. But the next wear are going to deliver a higher resolution in the center of your field of view, making them a better better fit for clarity and detail on text or when watching a movie. Remember, by design, these glasses are not trying to block the real world around you. The goal is to give you better fidelity in the zone where your eyes are most discerning at a more affordable price point. But surely if we just keep ramping up, the total resolution will eventually beat these face displays, right? Yeah! But we can also see the costs on that are really high. Costs in battery life, in processing power, and literally in how hard they hit your wallet. Apple's Vision Pro has not made it to market yet at the time this video was produced, but we know they'll be using some really fancy new 4K micro OLEDs four times the resolution of these glasses per eye, but four times more dots spread out over a much larger field. When the major uses of a headset are second screen activities like document work, practical daily computing tasks, the pixels per degree are only going to be slightly better on the Vision Pro than on the next Wear S. So if you wanna know what that experience is gonna feel like, do a little work on a spreadsheet and see all the information in the cells. We can kinda already do that today and for a lot less than what Apple's headset will cost when it arrives. And as mentioned earlier, these things will be less costly for 
battery life. A fully self-contained MR headset might be able to run for a max of about three hours on a charge. These glasses pull power from a host device, but can run a fair bit longer out in the field. Connected to a phone, watching a movie. Runtime was poorer than watching the movie on the phone screen, set at medium brightness, but I had enough juice through the phone to make it through over six hours of video playback. I could watch video from LA to New York on a flight on a single charge. Playing a game on a Steam Deck, Battery life is pretty close. The deck has to power the glasses, but it also gets to disable the built-in display. We're talking about maybe a 1% difference in my testing, which is easily in margin of error territory. The projected display on these is quite a bit nicer than the built-in LCD on the Steam Deck. Or going dual screen with a small laptop. The examples all compare really well. You should be able to power a small face display longer out in the field on batteries before you need to charge the compute devices that power or the entertainment experience. Oculus, HTC, and Vision Pro are going to need a lot more support out in the field to match these run times. And you can't tell me that you're bothered by a cable running to your phone and be fine with the Vision Pro's soap on a rope battery. Don't be that guy. I really just don't see this being the future everyone jumps on. Another minor tech difference while we've been focusing mostly on visuals, the audio also contributes to the experience. Typically, we look for open speakers on mixed and augmented reality solutions. A lot of VR headsets had headphones that would block your ears. Here, we want to be able to focus on the audio, but not be completely blocked from the world around us, and you can always add other headphones if you need the extra isolation. These new speakers in the glasses arms direct that audio into your ears with a reasonably high degree of fidelity, but they shouldn't disturb people around you. It's open, so someone sitting right next to you will hear that something is playing, but it's not as likely they'll be able to hear exactly what you're watching. Lastly, we should cover the fancier tech associated with augmented reality, one of the longer sections of this video, namely the head tracking and space tracking. Another term you should be familiar with is degrees of freedom. Different than the field of view, which is measured in degrees, degrees of freedom describes how the sensors on a headset can track the user's movements and the space around the user. There are three main versions we want to understand. Zero degrees of freedom. Basically, the image you see from the glasses is always in your field of view. No matter where you look, that image is right in front of your face. Then we move to three degrees of freedom, sometimes called body relative tracking or body anchoring. The sensors on the glasses can detect three movements, horizontal, vertical, and tilts. With a three degree system, you can pin a window to one area, look away from that window and it will leave your field of view. Then when you turn back, the window will be where you placed it. Three degree headsets stay locked to the user's body though. They don't understand their location in a room. They only track the head movement from the user. So when you place a window to the right and you take a couple steps away from that window, when you turn back, it's still gonna be on your right shoulder. It's anchored to your body. If we wanna anchor a window in space, we need six degrees of freedom. That's where the headset is tracking the user's movements and the user's position in a room. The most technically aggressive form of this tracking for an AR system would be something like Microsoft's HoloLens, where it makes detailed scans of the environment around the user to deliver immersive content, but still let the user see that room. Now, there are three DOF and six DOF versions of the glasses, but like the Nextwear S, the most popular versions often only include the sensors for three degrees of freedom. Vision Pro, HTC XR Elite, Oculus Quest, they do all this inside out tracking for six degrees of freedom and they have processors to natively generate content. And that's one of the reasons why you can only get around two to three hours of runtime on a charge. That's the tricky bit. We have sensors in the glasses, then we need compute power to track all the movement, and then we need additional compute power to generate the content. During the Apple keynote, we saw Vision Pro has an M series processor, but the headset also needs a separate spatial computing chip to do all of the movement. In face display land, we're seeing companies tackle this with little mini brains. You know, some of these brains can deliver content, but they have no head tracking capabilities. Some of these brains will add the head tracking, but they can't deliver any of the content. For the next Wear S, specifically if your phone supports video output, there is an app which gives you a simplified AR user 
interface. Or on a Windows PC, you can create a virtual monitor space that docks application windows freeing up the physical monitor on your PC or laptop. Now, if your phone doesn't support video out through the USB-C port, there are other adapters that you can use for screen mirroring. And if you're interested in a rundown on what those options look like for wired and wireless connections, just drop me a comment down below and we'll see if we can produce a follow-up video. We can look at some of those phone systems and they definitely seem a little simple compared to the science fiction magic of Iron Man, but this is currently the most accessible and practical demonstration for augmented reality we have today. The core demonstration of Vision Pro that we've seen so far, what if you could put a TV where you didn't have a TV? Or what if you could use two whole computers to simulate the use of one whole computer with multiple monitors? If you wanted to float a TV out in space where a TV didn't exist, or if you wanted to add a second monitor to your PC, I mean, you know, for a lot less cash. We're in the wild west with augmented reality, and it's critical that we accurately describe different products for different consumers do different things at different price points because there is no one correct way to augment reality. A really techy, powerful, expensive pair of mixed reality goggles is one solution at the high end of the market. But increasingly, the area surrounding more affordable, practical, portable face displays is becoming a lot more competitive, especially where you can easily displace bigger and bulkier accessories for travel, or if you just wanna enjoy a little more flexibility for your home entertainment needs. But for all this talking for how long this video is, maybe you really just need to put a TV in a briefcase, in which case, this video was really not for you, but I digress. I've been covering heads up displays and cinema displays for well over a decade now. And what we can do with a sleek pair of glasses today is so impressive. These things are a lot of fun. The trickiest part of this whole conversation is just getting people to try them. You really do not know what this experience is like until you get these screens in front of your eyes. I'm hoping more people over the next year or two are gonna try getting these screens in front of their eyes. A huge thank you again to the folks at TCL Rain Neo for sponsoring this conversation. This is a video I've wanted to put together for a while now, and hopefully it helps inform some of the conversation around different products and different solutions. We need to build the competition in this space so no one gets left behind. I think the next Wear S are excellent competitors in this space. And of course, I wanna hear from you if there's any interest in another roundup, maybe compare some of the different headsets out there. I could do another follow-up from my last glasses video. Drop me some comments down below. What do you wanna see in another headset comparison? What parts of this conversation do you think would help people understand them better. I happily await your replies. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos and subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been amazing. Those of you hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or clicking on links in the descriptions of my videos here, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet. I basically post everywhere is at some gadget guy, spending quite a bit of my time these days on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, but I will catch you all on the next video.